As we're moving towards uh, our Resurrection Sunday remembrance of uh, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem at the beginning uh, of the Passion Week and his journey to the cross at the end of the Passage Week, or the Passion Week, uh, I thought we have a good opportunity to revisit uh, mission this morning. Um, Jesus, uh, Jesus is on mission, and he will not be distracted from that mission, and that mission is the Father's will. He's been on mission to do the Father's will since the beginning, and this is hard for us to comprehend, since the beginning of eternity past. It's hard for us to understand eternity and what eternity is, um, because we're, we, don't, we haven't experienced that uh, in this life, because part of the punishment for sin is death. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 50, uh, 51, we read these words about Jesus' determination towards completing uh, the mission that he is on since eternity passed. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, the scripture tells us that he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. That's an expression that means uh, that nothing, absolutely nothing, would keep Jesus from completing the mission of his father, the will of his father which was, from eternity past, the journey to the cross. You know, the, the, uh, in, in Isaiah, in the Old Testament, it says that it pleased him. Isaiah 53, it pleased God to crush him. Jesus won't be deterred from that. This past Thursday, Heather and Jared left for their field trip, as I mentioned in our prayer time. As they seek God through the Christian Missionary Alliance regarding their mission, where God will place them on their mission field, they're, they're headed to their mission. And they've been on that since their teenage years. Jared reminded me it might have been even earlier than that. The message title for today is this. Listen, everyone's everyday encounters. And our text for the message can be found in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. As Jesus continues... His final trek to Jerusalem on the way, as I mentioned, to the cross and to his resurrection on that first Sunday morning. As I was preparing for the message today, I was reminded in my heart and in my mind about the focus of the Northeastern District of the Christian Missionary Alliance regarding everyone's everyday encounters. Uh, here in the Northeastern District, it, uh, they've put forward a statement on missions, their mission focus related to kingdom advance uh, in the Christian and Missionary Alliance churches here in the Northeastern District, they, they've said this, their statement is this, make growth happen, make growth happen by engaging everyone as full ministry partners. Let me say that again. Make growth happen by engaging everyone as full ministry partners. Note the individual focus in that statement, that kingdom statement. Engaging everyone as full ministry partners. That's our, that's your and my individual call to mission. And how we get, to be honest with you, how we get mission done through everyone being full ministry partners on mission. The scripture for this individual all in mission engagement from the district that they backed that up with is from Ephesians chapter 4 beginning or in verse 15. It says this, rather... Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, even Christ. That's our spiritual growth. That's part of our mission. From whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's kingdom growth, loving our neighbor as ourself by loving them into the kingdom. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. A full ministry partner was Jesus' answer to the Pharisee's lawyer when he was asked the question in Matthew 22 by this lawyer of the Pharisees, the question was asked, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him this question to test him. He said, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, Jesus responded, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. There's the personal growth in mission. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. 
And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. Let's pray this morning as we consider everyone's everyday encounters. While trekking, listen, while traveling along with Jesus, undeterred on his final leg on mission to the cross in Jerusalem. Let's pray. God, I thank you for our time and your word this morning. God, guide and direct our hearts as we consider our individual encounters on mission, God, what you've called us to. Lord, I pray you'll guide and direct our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. When, in, when Jesus engaged this lawyer in Matthew 22, his engagement was individual. Listen, his engagement was individual, not organizational. Now, I say that for a reason. Although the question, when, Jesus, when the lawyer asked the question, although the question from the lawyer may have been organizational related to his perspective, and listen, what I mean by organizational was that was, it was asked on behalf, remember Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the group of them, the organization of the Sadducees. It was asked on behalf of the Pharisees and now the Sadducees and or the religious leadership as a whole. So the lawyer asking the question was asking for the question from an organizational religious structure organization position. Jesus was not responding to a religious organization as a whole. He was responding individually in his response. His response was individual and personal in nature. Here are a few opening questions for today's study in the Word. Do I, do you expect mission, listen, do you expect mission before you every day? Anticipation, do you anticipate that? Do I, do you expect encounters for gospel mission on a regular basis? Am I, are you in tune, listen, are you in tune with the Holy Spirit as he guides such everyday encounters in your life? Here's some follow-up questions as we begin our time together and look at God's Word and Jesus on mission to divine appointments for Him. Do you have friends? Do you have friends who don't believe? Do you have a best friend? Do you have a best friend who does not believe? Who are they? Do you have a picture of them in your mind? Can you see them in your mind in this moment, do you, do you have a picture of them maybe on your phone or tablet? Does that picture in your mind and on your phone remind you daily of your individual mission? Not an organizational mission, meaning the church organization as a whole. Do you have other people in your life that you are in relationship with? Are those folks outside the body of Christ? I see all these questions, listen folks, I see all these questions as rhetorical questions because we all have such connections with all these type of people in our lives, therefore there, the, all those questions are rhetorical because the answer to that question is yes, we do. None of us escapes relationships in this short life, none of us. In fact, as I've often said, God has built us for relationships. Relationship with him first and with one another. Just this past weekend, my brother had come into town to drop off his taxes at, at uh, Keith's office to do his taxes, and we ran into one another, and uh, he wanted to catch up. So uh, he came over to visit us at, at my house, and he decided to sit with us for a little bit. And our discussion was this funny thing, but our discussion was this exact discussion as we were catching up as family members. It was about relationship. And how important in this short life relationship is to God. Did you ever, let me ask you this question. Did you ever think to yourself that you wished someone would have taught you something long before you learned it in this life? You learned it later in life and you wish, man, I wish I knew that 20 years ago. Hindsight's always 20 20. For the students in here today, that question might not be such a good question because you haven't lived that long. In fact, maybe for those younger folks that are here right now, I'm going to be thinking, what can this old guy teach me this morning? Stay with me. I might teach you something this morning, something that you wish, or something that I wished I learned long ago when I was maybe your age um, and didn't learn till later on in life. Besides my faith in Jesus, which I learned later on in life and wished that someone had brought to me sooner, because I wasted way too many years, 
The next most important thing I wish someone had taught me earlier in life was this. Listen, folks, life is tremendously short. And it will be over more quickly than you can imagine right now. Students, listen. I'm just going to tell you. Life is tremendously short. I used to tell my kids, don't rush to get out of school. You know, kids are in a rush. Get me. I got I to get out of school. I hate school. I hate. I hate. Senioritis set in for my kids four years before it should have started. All right. Life is short. Don't waste any of it. Do what is most important, internally important, as your short days are numbered. I wish I knew that earlier in life. James spoke about the shortness of our days this way. Beginning in chapter 4 and verse 1, he said, Come now, you who say tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and we'll spend a year there and we'll trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? Listen, for you are a mist. You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this and that. When I said goodbye to my parents, whom I'm, I won't speak to again on this side of paradise, I realized just how short life is and what is of most importance. It's relationships. That's why I mentioned the questions about your best friend your connections, your relationships in this life. God built us for relationship. Relationship, as I mentioned, with him first and then with one another second. And, and that is what is of most importance in this life. Our days are very short of vapor. They're, therefore, being able to get at building relationships, especially building relationships so they lead to the most important thing, eternal life in Christ, is of utmost importance for us. Do you believe that God connects you? Listen, do you believe that God connects you with everyday appointments and or everyday encounters with family, with friends, with others around us for kingdom purposes? Do you believe that? Do you think that God is concerned about those around you and has placed you directly, directly in their path for kingdom purposes? By the way, both of those questions are rhetorical as well. Because the answer is yes. God does this. So then here's follow-up questions. What will you do with such God appointments, God connections, and or God encounters? However you want to refer to them. By engaging these questions, I want to demonstrate from the Word of God what we should do with such encounters. One of the best examples from Scripture of everyday, everyone's everyday encounters that I can give from Scripture is Jesus' own example. The Master set the example for us. Here's an interesting question about Jesus' everyday encounters. It's just a, a question I wrestle with in my mind. Was Jesus guided and directed by the Holy Spirit in his earthly encounters? There's an interesting question. I asked the question this way on purpose. I did not ask if Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized with the Holy Spirit. Here's the question again. Was Jesus guided and directed by the Holy Spirit in his earthly encounters? I believe the answer to that question is yes. Let me offer some scriptural background for the answer. It's found in Matthew chapter 3 beginning in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John. John the Baptist, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and, and you do come to me. But Jesus answered him, let it be so, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John the Baptist consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately, listen, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And coming to rest upon him, and behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son. On mission from eternity past. Starting his earthly ministry. If we say it that way, if we can say it that way. 
This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. The words coming to rest mean that the Holy Spirit was coming upon him, which is consistent with the interpretation of the role of the Holy Spirit from the Old Testament. I'm not uh, sure theologically that Jesus was filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit, meaning that the Holy Spirit took up residence in his heart. As we have the ability today, as uh, we as believers are promised that in John chapter 16, I do not know if the Holy Spirit guided and directed him always, or I, I, I do know that the Holy Spirit guided and directed him always as he was in tune constantly with God and the Holy Spirit as part of the Trinity. As an example, just as an example, right after the baptism, he was immediately, listen, he was immediately led in the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. That's why I say the Holy Spirit prompted him, and there he was tempted by the enemy. The reason I say that the Holy Spirit was coming upon him is that Jesus overcame, listen, that Jesus overcame sin in the flesh through the reliance of the Holy Spirit. If Jesus came, overcame the enemy with his divinity rather than his flesh, guided by the Holy Spirit, then you and I are in serious trouble because we don't have divinity. If Jesus overcame sin in any portion of his, with any portion of his divinity, then we are much to be pitied, as Paul said, because we don't have a, the divine nature that could help us overcome sin like Jesus. Therefore, I believe Jesus overcame sin in the flesh, guided by the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit ever left him. The Holy Spirit was never... He, he, remember, he, it's hard for us to understand the Trinity because they're three in one, yet separate. Okay? Now, I've processed you to this point for this reason. I think Jesus being directed by the Holy Spirit in this manner is the same way that you and I are directed by the Holy Spirit as we have the Holy Spirit that's been given to us to take up residence in our heart as a gift so that we can be guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. It's a John 16 and an Acts 1-8 thing. John 16, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. After Jesus promised that he would give the Spirit to us and he would take up residence. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Jesus was listening to the same Holy Spirit. And he will declare to you all things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare to you. Remember, Jesus said, all things are mine, given to him by the Father. All that the Father has, has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. And then in Acts 1.8, but you will see, listen, you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Mission. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, I don't have time to examine both of these scriptures this morning, but I would encourage you to examine them when you have a chance. If the Holy Spirit does this with Jesus, he also does this with you and me, just as Jesus promised. Now, let's press forward with the Holy Spirit in everyone's everyday encounters. Turn with me to Luke chapter 19, our text for today. You didn't know that that was the introduction. We're on page 8. It's going to be a long message today. I'm just kidding. We'll start reading there in verse 1 of Luke chapter 19. Here we go. He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold... I told you I love that word behold because whatever comes next is important for us to pay attention to. Behold. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief, he was a chief tax collector and was rich. Listen, he wasn't just a tax collector. He had a bunch of tax collectors working for him. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. He'd heard about him. Obviously, rumors had passed. He'd heard about him and all the things that Jesus was doing. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. He was short and he couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. For I must stay at your house today. 
So he hurried and he came down and he received him joyfully. Jesus was informed about this encounter, in my opinion. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. Now they're all complaining when Jesus went to eat at Zacchaeus' house because they hated him. He was a Jewish guy collecting taxes for the occupying Roman government. And he was a sinner in their eyes. And they all grumbled. He has gone to the guest of a man who is a sinner. Not only is he a sinner, he's a chief sinner because he has ten men doing it for him as well. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Four times he's going to pay them back. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Did Jesus receive, listen, did Jesus receive a divine appointment via the Holy Spirit, guiding and directing his steps into the life of Zacchaeus? I think that is the best way to describe this scene. I do not believe this is a haphazard encounter. I don't believe it's a haphazard encounter. I think this is an excellent representation of how mission encounter is accomplished and Jesus is demonstrating, listen to what Jesus is doing on his road to Jerusalem, on his way to the cross. Jesus is demonstrating and modeling it before the eyes of his disciples, you and me as well as his disciples in that day. He's demonstrating and modeling it in on-the-job training, on-the-job training for them and on-the-job training for us as we read it today. Look at what takes place. A heart, a heart was yearning to be free from sin. Zacchaeus' heart was yearning to be free from sin. That's why he was looking for the master. Amen? The Holy Spirit was pulling him because that's what happens. That's why he was looking for the master. And my heart, at some point in my life, was being drawn the same way. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. Jesus promised in John chapter 16, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I was Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, his heart is yearning. That's why he's looking for Jesus. Zacchaeus eventually admits as much. Zacchaeus is looking to see Jesus because he has heard about him, the one who forgives sin and heals the sick. He hears that Jesus is coming through his town and he cannot get to Jesus quick enough. The crowds around Jesus have swelled tremendously and Zacchaeus wants to get as close as possible. He just wants a glimpse. And I believe that the Holy Spirit directed Jesus' steps, revealed who Zacchaeus was to Jesus, and set up a gospel appointment. I believe that's what happened. I also believe the Holy Spirit was moving Zacchaeus' heart as well, as I just mentioned. And I believe the Holy Spirit continues to do that today. I hope you believe that as well. If I were to ask you if you believe that, you probably would say yes he does move that. He moves hearts in that way. But I wonder, do we view that he moves hearts in that way in our life, with us individually, or are we viewing it as an organizational? That's why I mentioned that early on. Do we have, I would ask this question, as we're traveling as disciples along with Jesus in this life, do we have in our schedule time for such engagements? Are our hearts in tune for such engagements with the Holy Spirit? Are we in relationship, actually in settings, that make us available for such Holy Spirit-directed relationship encounters? Are we in settings to be able to do that? Now, there's two reasons I believe this was the Holy Spirit set up as a mission encounter. 
First, Zacchaeus' heart, as I mentioned, had to be moved. And the scripture teaches us that the Holy Spirit convicts, as I mentioned, the world of, uh, the, the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment in John chapter 16. The Holy Spirit moves Zacchaeus' heart to remember his sin and convicted him of his need for forgiveness. That's the first evidence that the Holy Spirit is involved in the encounter. In fact, and the reason we know that Zacchaeus was converted is he said, I will repay. I, he, will, he repented and said, I will re repay. The second reason Jesus himself testified about encounters like this in John chapter 6 and verse 38. Listen. Listen to what Jesus said. This is the master. He said, for I have come down from heaven, eternity past, not to do my own will. Boy, I tell you folks, setting our own will aside to, to have Jesus encounters, Holy Spirit encounters. That's what Jesus did. I have come down from the Father to do my own, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That's who we are as disciples. And this is the will of him who sent me. That of all that he has given me, I lose nothing that's us. Christians, Christ-like, he's the master. He set the example. And then I raise it up on the last day. That's our trophies. That's the eternal stuff that we're going to raise up. We're going to lay at the feet of Jesus at the bema seat of Christ in judgment. When we're judged as believers. And the only thing that remains is what doesn't burn up in the fire. And guess what's the only thing that remains? Eternity. Eternal stuff. Are we engaged in that? For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. By Jesus' own words, God scheduled this encounter with Zacchaeus through the Holy Spirit, placing this divine appointment, listen, on Jesus' calendar. On, and on Zacchaeus' schedule, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. By the way, folks, here's what I want to tell you in our world today of technology and stuff. Man did not invent wireless communication. Man didn't invent wireless communication. God did. And he communicates to us wireless through the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. And that's what he's doing here with Zacchaeus and Jesus. Here's a thought from our technologically savvy world. Wouldn't it be great if our wireless Holy Spirit connection brings about, listen, brings about Google Calendar appointments, encounters that are intentional? They're on my calendar because God put them there through the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a great idea? Did you check your calendar lately? Further, wouldn't it be great if our wireless Holy Spirit encounters would bubble up, listen, would bubble up to the top of our Google calendar and be of high priority? in this short life. Because here's what I'm going to tell you folks, the folks that you are engaged in, you don't know when it's over for them. They have a divine appointment. Psalm 139. Back to our scene. Jesus is modeling the ministry for these disciples as he is training every one of them as full ministry, back to the district's position, uh, statement on mission, as full ministry partners because he is about, listen, he's about ready to leave. He's about ready to turn this ministry over to them just like he's turned it over to us. We are them.
I believe he has received and understood this divine appointment set up by the Holy Spirit. I believe he has stepped in and responded by going to Zacchaeus' neighborhood. I believe that he is being obedient to God's word and not lose one that God gave him as he goes to Zacchaeus' house to sit with what the world back then would have called a sinner to build relationship with him and bring him the truth of Scripture. And look at Zacchaeus' posture. Look at his posture. He's wallowing in sin. He's a rich man wallowing in sin. He is wondering if he'll ever be free from it. This is why Zacchaeus desperately wants to get a glimpse of Jesus and get anywhere near him. Zacchaeus is haunted by his sin and wants to be freed from it, and he believes that Jesus can and will do it. He so wants to be freed from his sin that he risks embarrassing himself as a rich man to climb a tree in his suit. What an embarrassment. What an embarrassing situation, yet he does it because of where, what his heart is yearning for. I also know from the story here that Jesus met Zacchaeus' need and freed him from his sin because of Jesus or Zacchaeus' response. He said he would repay four times anyone that he had defrauded. Zacchaeus, after this encounter with Jesus, is free from sin as he demonstrates a changed heart. Jesus has renewed him. Jesus has saved him. At one point in my life, I was looking for the same thing. I wasted too many years of my short life not knowing Jesus and being freed from my sin. I wanted desperately to be rescued from my sin, wishing now with hindsight that somebody earlier in my life would have told me about it. Here's some thoughtful and maybe motivational different perspective questions as we wrap up our time in the Word this morning. Had someone missed their encounter with me, as I look back on it, and it happened later in life rather than earlier, had someone missed their encounter with me? I think that's an interesting question. Had God sent others who missed it Maybe others when I was in high school who were believers and friends of mine who had missed it. Are we missing opportunities? Are we missing opportunities with our friends in the same way? In our connections, in our encounters with people that God has put. Look at at what Jesus is doing here with his disciples in tow. Jesus is modeling the ministry for the disciples as he is training them as full ministry partners to be fully engaged and not lose one that they are called to. Not lose one. He is prepping them for the handoff of the ministry, fully engaged, fully equipped for kingdom advance as players on the team. This is why we are engaged with others, or should be engaged with others intentionally. This is not, listen folks, I'm going to throw you a curveball. This is not ministry of the church. This is not program of the church. This is an encounter for you personally with a dead person. You get that, right? This is an encounter for you personally with a dead person. They are dead in their trespasses and sins. And the only way they're going to be rescued, the only way they're going to be rescued is as the Holy Spirit moves their heart and moves your and my heart to be engaged in their life. And Jesus is passing this off to the disciples. These goofy fishermen who have figured nothing out at this point and aren't going to figure it out until he's hanging on a tree, then they're going to go, oh, that's what he meant. Everyone's everyday encounters. Isn't that why you and I are called to be on the team? Jesus intentionally went to Zacchaeus' house. His purpose was to build relationship personally in order to get him to confess his sin that separated him from God and free him from his sin. 
I wonder, I wonder how many Zacchaeus appointments maybe I've missed in this life. Because other things took precedent. I wonder if I need a perspective or we need a perspective shift in how we view our everyday Zacchaeus encounters. Do we expect them? Do we recognize them? Do we anticipate them? Do we see with Jesus' eyes those encounters? Let me tell you about those encounters. For you personally, this is not, again, organizational. This is not church. This is not church ministry. And I'm saying that. It is ministry, but it's not church ministry as putting or, or diverting attention to the church. This is a responsibility of the church. We are the church. I'm the church. Individually. On the job training. Demonstrated for me. Jesus showing these disciples. Listen to the text that is yours and mine to own individually, not as an organization. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, personal, you and me, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, listen, for good works which God prepared beforehand in eternity past. Just like he prepared the works for Jesus to walk in, to go to the cross, this meeting with Zacchaeus, God from eternity past, before you and I took breath, created good works, which God prepared beforehand, that you and I should walk in them. It's in the text. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I pray, Father God, for your Holy Spirit enlightenment in our hearts. Your Holy Spirit's movement in our relationship with our friends. I pray for the young folks that are here this morning and movement in their hearts about the relationships with their friends as they... God, walk close with you, and, and God, uh, may you provide them with encounters. May you provide us individually with encounters. May you wake uh, our spirit to our everyday encounters. May God, they move to the front of our calendar, the ones you ordained and prepared beforehand from the foundation of the world for us to walk in. Pray, God, you'll guide and direct our hearts in this Jesus' name. Amen. I'll close our, our, our time today with this thought. And it's from our text. It's from our passage. And I'll follow it with, a, uh, with the two questions that I wrote that I believe are wonderful questions to wrestle with on a regular basis related to um, uh, our, our placement on mission, um, our, our, our placement in engagement. At the end of our text today, after the encounter that Zacchaeus had, our text finishes, and I want you to fill in the name, because wouldn't it be great to be able to say, wouldn't it be great to be able to say this, like Jesus said, Jesus said, today's Zacchaeus, you fill in the name. You fill in the name. Because he's given you the encounters. Today, Zacchaeus, blank, salvation. Wouldn't it be great for you to be able to say this to somebody you're engaged with? Today, salvation has come to your house. Since you are now a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Zacchaeus is in dead in his trespasses and sins any longer. Wouldn't it be great to say that? Wouldn't it be great to have that, our, our discussion at the end of our engagement with our best friend who doesn't know Jesus? Or one of our family members who don't know Jesus? Or one of our, our friends in school? Who doesn't know Jesus? Wouldn't it, be able, wouldn't it be great to be able to say to them, today salvation has come to you in your house. I'll leave you with these 
two questions as you go today. What can you do on mission today? What can you do on mission today? And who is your gospel appointment with today? Two great questions. God bless you as you go.